Anastasia by Vladimir McGrath, book one of the Ringing Cedar series. On a trade trip to the Siberian Taiga in 1995, Vladimir McGrath learned about sacred ringing cedar trees of unusual healing power. He spent three days with a woman named Anastasia who shared with him her unique outlook on gardening, child rearing, healing, nature, sexuality, religion, and more. Deeply transformed by this wilderness experience, Vladimir wrote this book about the spiritual insights Anastasia has so generously shared with him. True to her promise, this life-changing book has become an international bestseller and has touched hearts of millions of people worldwide. Anastasia herself has stated that this book consists of words and phrases and combinations which have a beneficial effect on the reader. This has been attested by the letters received today from thousands of readers all over the world. If you wish to gain as full an appreciation as possible of the ideas, thoughts, and images set forth here, as well as experience the benefits that come with this appreciation, we will recommend you find a quiet place for your reading where there is the least possible interference from artificial noises such as moto traffic, radio, TV, household appliances, and etc. Natural sounds, on the other hand, the singing of birds, for example, or the patter of rain, or the rustle of leaves on nearby trees, may be a welcome, a companion to the reading process. exist for those for whom I exist. Anastasia. Chapter 1. The Ringing Cedar. In the spring of 1994, I chartered three river boats on which I carried out a three-month expedition on the River Ob to Siberia from Novosibirsk to Selkshard and back. The aim of the expedition was to foster economic ties with the regions of the Russian Far North. The expedition went under the name of the Merchant Convoy. The largest of the three river boats was a passenger ship named the Patrice Lumumba. Western Siberian river boats bear rather interesting names. The Maria Alnava, the Patrice Lamumbai, the Michael Kalimnia, as, as if there were no other personage in history worth commemorating. The lead ship Patrice Lamumbai housed the expedition headquarters, along with a store where local Siberian entrepreneurs could exhibit their wares. The plan was for the convoy to travel north. 3,500 kilometers, visiting not only major ports of call such as Tomsk, Nishemvorsk, Kanti Matsyaks, and Sakhard, 
but smaller places as well where goods could be unloaded only during a brief summer navigation um, season. The convoy would dock at a popular, populated settlement during the daytime. We would offer the wares we had bought, brought for sale and hold talks about setting up regular economic links. Our traveling was usually done at night. If weather conditions were unfavorable for navigation, the lead ship would put into the nearest port and would organize onboard parties for the local young people. Most places offered little in the way of their own entertainment. Clubs and community centers, so-called House of Cultures, have been going downhill ever since the collapse of the USSR, and there were almost no culture activities available. Sometimes we might go for 24 hours or more without seeing a single populated place. Even the tiniest villages, village, from the river, the only transportation orderly for many kilom kilom kilometers around, the only thing visible to the eye was the taiga itself. I was not yet aware at the time that somewhere amidst the un inhabited vastness of forests along the river bank, a surprise meeting was awaiting me, one that was to change my whole life. One day on our way back to Norversburgs, I arranged to dock the lead ship at a small village, one with only a few houses at best, some 30 or 40 kilometers distance distant from the largest, larger population centers. I planned a three hour stopover so the crew could have shore leave and the local residents could buy some of our goods and feed stops. And we could cheaply pick up from them fish and wild growing plants of the taiga. Of the taiga. During our stopover time as the leader of the expedition I was approached by two of the local senior citizens. As I judge at the time, one of them appeared to be somewhat older than the other. The elder of the two, a wizened fellow, a wise fellow with a long gray beard, kept silent the whole time, leaving his younger companion to do the talking. This fellow tried to persuade me to lend him 50 of my crews, which numbered no more than 65 in total, to go with them into the taiga. About 25 kilometers or so from the dock where the ship was berthed, they would be taken into the depths of the taiga to cut down a tree he described as a ringing cedar. The cedar, which he said reached 40 meters in height, needed to be cut up into pieces, which could be carried by hand to the ship. We must, he said, definitely take the whole lot. The old fellow further recommended that each piece be cut up into smaller pieces. Each of us should keep one for himself and give the rest to relatives, friends, and anyone who wished to accept a piece as a gift. He said this was a most unusual cedar. The piece should be worn on one's chest as a pendant. Hang it around your neck while standing barefoot in the grass and then press it to your chest with the palm of your left hand. It takes only a moment to feel the pleasing warmth emanating from the piece of cedar, followed by a light tingling sensation running through the whole body. From time to time, whenever desire, the side of the pendant facing away from the body should be rubbed with one's finger, the thumb pressed against the other side. The old fellow confidently assured me that within three months, the possessor of one of these ringing cedar pendants, pendants will feel significant, significant improvement in his sense of well-being and will be cured of many diseases. 
even AIDS. <clears throat> even AIDS, I ask, even AIDS, I ask, and briefly explain what I had learned from this disease from the press. The oldest confidently reply, from any and all diseases. But this, he considered, was an easy task. The main benefit was that anyone having one of these penments would become kinder, more successful, and more talented. I did know a little about the healing properties of the cedars of our Siberian tiger, taiga, but the suggestion that it could affect one's feelings and abilities, well, to me seemed beyond the bounds of probability. The thought came to me that maybe these old men wanted money from me for this unusual cedar, as they themselves called it. And I began explaining that out in the big wide world, women were used to wearing jewelry made of gold and silver and wouldn't pay a dime for some scrap of wood. And so I wasn't going to lay out any money for anything like that. They don't know what they're wearing, came the reply. Gold, well, that's thus in comparison with one of piece of the cedar, with one piece of the cedar. But we don't need any money for it. We can give you some dry mushrooms in addition, but there's nothing we need from you. Not wanting to start an argument, out of respect for their age, I said, well, maybe someone will wear some of your cedar pendants. They certainly would if a top wood carving craftsman agreed to put his hand to it and create something of amazing beauty. To which the old fellow replied, yes, you could carve it, but it would be better to polish it by rubbing. It will be a lot better if you do this yourself with your fingers, whenever your heart desires. Then the cedar will also have a beautiful look to it. Then the younger of the two quickly unbuttoned first his old worn jacket and then his shirt and revealed what he was wearing on his chest. I looked and saw a puffed out circle or oval. It was multicolored, purple, raspberry, auburn, forming some kind of puzzling design. The vein lines on the wood looks like little streams. I am not a connoisseur of objet d'art. Although from time to time I have had occasion to visit picture galleries, the world's great masters had not called forth any particular emotions in me. But the objects, the object hanging around this man's neck aroused significantly greater feelings and emotion than any of my visit to the textbook gallery. How many years have you been rubbing this piece of cedar, I asked. Ninety-three, the old fellow responded. And how old are you? A hundred and nineteen. At the time, I didn't believe him. He looked like a man of seventy-five. Either he hadn't noticed my doubts or if he had, he paid no attention to them. In somewhat excited tone, he started He started, in trying to persuade me that any piece of the cedar polished by human fingers alone would also look beautiful in just three years. Then it would start looking even better and better, especially when worn by a woman. The body of its warrior would give off a pleasant and beneficial aroma, quite unlike anything artificially produced by men. Indeed, a very pleasant fragrance was emanating from both these old men. I could feel it, even though I'm a smoker, and unlike all smokers, have a dull sense of smell. And there was one other Peculiarity. I suddenly became aware of phrases in the speech of these strangers that were not common to the resident of this isolated part of the North. Some of them I remember to this day, even the intonations associated with them. Here was the, what the old fellow told me. God created the cedar to store cosmic energy. 
When someone is in a state of love, they emit a radiant energy. It takes but a second for it to reflect off the celestial bodies floating overhead and come back to earth and give life to everything that breathes. The sun is one of those celestial bodies and it reflects but a tiny fraction of such radiance. Only bright rays can travel into space from man on the earth and only beneficial rays can be reflected from space back to earth. Under the influence of malicious feelings, man can emit only dark rays. These dark rays cannot rise, but must fall into the depths of the earth. Bouncing off its core, they return to the surface in the form of volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, wars, and etc. The culminating achievement of these dark rays is their direct effect on the man originating them, invariably exacerbating this man's own malicious feelings. Cedars live to be 550 years old. Day and night, their millions of needles catch and store the whole spectrum of bright energy. During the period of the cedars' life, all the celestial bodies pass above them, reflecting this bright energy. Even in one tiny piece of cedar, there is more energy beneficial to men than in all the man-made energy installations taken together. Cedars receive the energy emanating from men through space, store it up, at the right moment give it back. They give it back when there is not enough of it in space. In other words, in man or in everything living and growing on the earth. Occasionally though, very rarely, one discovers cedars that have been storing up energy but not giving back what they have stored. After 500 years of their life, they start to ring. This is how they talk to us, through their quiet ringing sound. This is how they signal people to take them and saw them up, to make use of their stored up energy on the earth. This is what the cedars are axing with their ringing sound. They keep on axing for three whole years. If they don't have contact with living human beings, then in three years, deprive of the opportunity to give back what they have received and stored from space. They lose their ability to give it back directly to men. Then they will start burning up with the energy internally. This torturous process of burning and dying lasts 27 years. Not long ago, we discovered a cedar like this. We determined that it had been ringing for two years already. It was ringing very softly. Perhaps it is trying to draw out its requests over a longer period of time, but still it has only one year left. It must be sought up and given away to people. The old man spoke at length, and for some reason I heard him out. The voice of this strange old cyber, cyberac, cyber sounded at first quietly confident, then very excited. And when he got excited, he would rub the piece of cedar with his fingertip as though they were lightly tripping over some kind of musical instrument. I w it was cold on the river bank. An autumn wind was blowing across the river. Gusts of wind ruffled the hair on the old men's capless heads but the spokesman jacket and shirt remain unbuttoned. His fingertips kept rubbing the cedar pendant on his chest, still exposed to the wind. He was still trying to explain its significance to me. Lydia Prechovna, an employer of my firm, came down the gangplank to tell me that everyone else was already on board and are waiting for me to finish my conversation. I bade farewell to the oldsters and quickly climbed aboard. I couldn't act on their request for two reasons. Delaying departure, especially for three days, would mean an 
would mean a significant financial loss. And besides, everything this, these old fellows said seemed to me at the time to be in the realm of pure superstition. The next morning, during our usual company meeting, I suddenly noticed that Lydia Petrovna was fingering a cedar pendant of her own. Later, she would tell me that after I'd give gone abroad, she stayed behind for a while. She noticed that when I started hurrying away from them, the oldster that had been talking with, with me stared af after me with a perplexed look and then said excitedly, excitedly to his older companion, Now how can that be? Why didn't they get it? I really don't know how to speak their language. I couldn't make them believe. I simply couldn't. Why? Tell me, father. The elder man put his hand on his son's shoulder and replied, You weren't convincing, convincing enough, son. They didn't grasp it. As I was going up the gangplank, Lydia Petrovna went on. The old man that was talking with you suddenly rushed up to me, grabbed me by the arm, and led me back down to the grass below. He hurriedly pulled out of his pocket a string. Attached to it was this piece of cedar wood. He put it around my neck and pressed it against my chest with the palm of both his hand and mine. I even felt the shiver go through my whole body. Somehow he managed to do all this very quickly and I didn't even get a chance to say anything to him. As I was walking away, he called after me, have a safe journey, be happy. Please come again next year. All the best people will be waiting for you. Have a safe journey. As the ship pulled away from the dock, the old fellow kept on waving at us for a long time and then all at once sat down on the grass. I was watching him through a pair of binoculars. The old man that talked with you and later gave me the pendant, I saw him sit down on the grass and his shoulders were trembling. The older one with the long beard was bending over him and stroking his head. Amidst the flurry of my subsequent commercial dealings, account keeping and end of voyage farewell banquets, I completely forgot about the strange Siberian oldsters. Upon my return to Novice Curves, I afflicted with sharp I was afflicted with sharp pains. The diagnose the, the diagnosis a duodenal intestinal ulcer and osteochondrosis of the thrust pain spine. In the quiet of the comfy hospital ward, I was cut off from the bustle of everyday life. My deluxe private room gave me an opportunity to calmly reflect, reflect on my four-month expedition and to draw up a business plan for the future. But it seemed as though my memory relegated just about everything that had happened to the background. And for some reason, the old men and what they said came to the forefront of my thought. I request, this, I request to have delivered to me in the hospital all sorts of literature of seat on cedars. After comparing what I read with what I had heard, I became more and more amazed and began to actually believe what the oldsters had said. There was at least some kind of truth in their words, or maybe the whole thing was true. In books on folk medicine, there is a lot said about the cedar as a healing remedy. They say that everything from the tips of the needles to the bark is endowed with highly effective healing pro properties. The Siberian cedar wood has a beautiful appearance and artistic wood carving. Masters enjoy great success in using it for furniture, as well as soundboards for musical instruments. Cedar needles are highly capable of decontaminating, decontaminating the surrounding air. Cedar wood has a distinctive, pleasant, balsam fragrance. 
A small cedar chip placed inside a house would keep moths away. In the popular science literature, I read it was said that the qualitative characters, characteristics for the northern cedars were significantly higher than for those growing in the south. Back in 1792, the, the, uh, the Acad Academian P.S. Pallas wrote that the fruits of the Siberian cedars were effective in restoring youth and vitality in virility and significantly increasing the body's ability to withstand a number of diseases. There is a whole host of hysterical phenomena directly or indirectly linked to the Siberian cedar. Here is one of them. In 1907, a 50-year-old semi-literature peasant named Gregory Rasputin, who held from an isolated Siberian village in an area where the Siberian cedar grows, found himself in St. Petersburg, the capital, and soon became a regular guest of the imperial family. Not only did he amaze them with his predictions, but he possessed incredible sexual stamina. At the time of his assassination, onlookers were struck by the fact that despite his bullet-ridden body, he continued to live, perhaps because he had been raised on cedar nuts in a part of the country where cedars abound. This is how a contemporary journalist described his staying power. At age 50, he could begin an orgy at noon and go on a rousing until four o'clock in the morning. From his, fornica from his fornication and drunkness, he would go directly to the church for morning prayers and stand praying until eight before heading home for a cup of tea. Then as, if, then as if nothing had happened, he would carry on receiving visitors until two in the afternoon. Next, he would collect a group of ladies and accompany them to the baths. From the baths, he would be off to a restaurant in the country where he would begin repeating the previous night's activities. No normal person could ever keep up a regime like that. The many-time world champion and Olympic champion wrestler Alexander Kerlin, who has never been defeated so far, is also a Siberian, also from an area where the Siberian cedar grows. The strong man also eats cedar nuts. A coincidence? I mention only those facts which can be easily verified in popular science literature or which could be confirmed by witnesses. Lydia Prechovna, who was giving the ringing, ringing cedar pendant by the Siberian ulcer, is now one of those witnesses. She is 36 years old, married with two children. Her co-worker have noticed changes in her behavior. She has become kinder and smiles more often. Her husband, whom I happen to know, told me that their family has now been experiencing a greater degree of mutual understanding. He also remarked that his wife was somehow become younger looking and it is starting to arouse greater feelings in him, more respect and quite possibly more love. But all these multitudinous facts and evidence pale in comparison to the main point, which you can look up for yourself, a discovery which had, has left me with not a trace of doubt. That is the Bible. In the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament, chapter 14, verse 4, God teaches us how to treat people and even decontaminate de um, their houses with the help of the cedar. After comparing all the facts and data I had gleaned from various sources, I was confronted by such a remarkable picture. That all the miracles known to the world faded before it. The great mysteries that have excited people's minds began to pale into insignificance in comparison with the mystery of the ringing cedar. Now I could no longer have any doubts about its existence. 
they were all dispelled by the popular science literature and the old Vedic scriptures. I was reading, <clears throat> cedars are mentioned 42 times in the Bible, all in the Old Testament. When Moses presented humanity with the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, he probably knew more than has been recorded in the Old Testament. We are accustomed to the fact that in nature there are various plants capable of treating human ills. The healing properties of the cedar have been attested in popular science literature by such serious and authoritative researchers at, as Akamedician Palace. And this is consistent with the Old Testament scriptures. And now, pay careful attention. When the Old Testament talks about the cedar, it is just the cedar alone. Nothing is said about other trees. And doesn't the Old Testament say that the cedar is the most potent medicine of any existing in nature? What is this, anyway? A medicine kit? And how is it to be used? And why out of all the Siberian cedars did these strange old fellow point to a single, single ringing cedar? But that's not all. Something immeasurably more mysterious lies behind the story from this from the Old Testament. Testament. King Solomon built a temple out of cedar wood. In return for the cedar from Lebanon, he gave another king Hiram twenty cities of his kingdom. Incredible. Giving away twenty cities just cities cities for just cities just for some kind of building materials? True, he got something else in returns. In return, at King Solomon's request, he was giving servants that were skilled in um, in felling timber. What kind of people were these? What knowledge did they possess? I have heard that even now, in the far flung reaches of the taiga. There are old people whose job is to choose trees for construction. But back then, over 2,000 years ago, everybody might have known this. Nevertheless, specialists of some sort were required. The temple was built, service was, services began to be held there, and the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. What kind of cloud was that? How and from where did it enter the temple? What could it have been? Energy? A spirit? What kind of phenomenon and what connection did it have with the cedar? The old fellows talk about the ringing cedar at storing up some kind of energy. Which cedars are stronger? The ones in Lebanon or Siberia? Academic, academic C in Palace said, that the healing properties of the cedars increase in proportion to their proximity to the forest tundra. In that case, then the Siberian cedar would be the stronger. It says in the Bible, by three fruits, ye shall know them. In other words, again, the Siberian cedar. Could it be that no one has paid any attention to all this? Has no one put two and two together? The Old Testament the science of the past century and the current one are all of the same opinion regarding the cedar. And Alana and Alana Ivanovan Rorich notes in her book Living Ethics, a chalice of cedar rests and figured in the rituals of the consecration of the kings of the ancient Khorasan. Jews also call the chalice of cedar resting in the chalice of life. And only later, with the loss of the realization of the spirit, was it replaced by the blood. The fire of Zoroaster was the result of burning of the cedar resin in the chalice. So then, how much of our forebears' knowledge of the cedar, its properties and uses, has been passed down to the present day? Is it possible that nothing has been preserved? What do the Siberian oysters know about it? 
And all at once, my memory harked back to an experience of many years ago, which caused a shiver to run up and down my spine. I didn't pay any attention to it back then, but now, during the early years of of Perestroika, I was president of the Association of the Siberian Entrepreneurs. One day I got a call from the Novgorod District Executive Council. Back then we still had Communist Party committees and executive councils, asking me to come to a meeting with a prominent Western businessman. He had a letter of recommendation from the government of the day. Several entrepreneurs were present along with the workers from the executive councils, council executive council secretary. The Western businessman was of a rather imposing external appearance, an unusual person with oriental features. He was wearing a turban, and his fingers were adorned with precious rings. The discussion, as usual, centered around the possibilities for cooperation in various fields. The visitor said, among other things, we would like to buy cedar nuts from you. As he spoke these words, his face and body tightened, and his sharp eyes moved from side to side, no doubt studying the reaction of the entrepreneurs present. I remember the incident very well, as even then I wondered why his appearance has changed like that. After the official meeting, the Moscow interpreter interpreter accompanying him came up to me. She said he would like to speak with me. The businessman made me a confidential proposal. If I could arrange delivery of cedar nuts for him, and they had to be fresh, then I would receive a handsome personal percentage over and above the official price. The nuts were to be shipped to Turkey for processing into some kind of oil. I said I would think it over. I decided I decide I would find out for myself what kind of oils he was talking about, and I did. On the London market, which sets the standard for world prices, Cedar nut oil fetches anywhere up to $500 per kilogram. Your proposed deal would have given in us approximately 2 to $3 for one kilogram of cedar nuts. I rang up an entrepreneur I happened to know in Warsaw and asked him whether it might be possible to market such a product directly to the consumer and whether we would learn the technology involved in its extraction. A month later, he sent me a reply, no way, we weren't able to gain access to the technology. And besides, there are certain Western powers so involved in these issues of yours that it would be better just to forget about it. After that, I turned to my good friend, Konstantin Ranknov, a scholar with our Novrix Consumer Cooperative Institute. I bought a shipment of nuts and finest a study. And the laboratories of these of his institute produce approximately a hundred kilograms of cedar nut oil. I also hired researchers who came up with the following information from our archi- from archival documents. Before the revolution and even for some time afterward, there was in Siberia, an organization organization known as the Siberian Cooperator. People from this organization traded in oil, including cedar nut oil. They had rather swanky branch offices in Harbin, London, and New York, and rather larger Western bank accounts. After the revolution, the organization eventually collapsed, and many of its members went abroad. A member of the Bolshevist government, Leo, Leonid Krasin, met with the head of this organization and asked him to return to Russia. But the head of the Siberian cooperator replied that he would be of more help to Russia if he remained outside its borders. From archival materials, I further learned that cedar oil was made using wooden, only wooden press 
in many villages of the Siberian, the Siberian tiger. Taiga. The quality of the cedar oil depended on the season in which the nuts were gathered and how they were processed, but I was unable to determine either from the archives or the institute exactly which season was being indicated. The secret had been lost. There are no healing remedies with properties analogs to those of cedar oil, but perhaps the secret of making this oil had been passed along by one of the immigrants to someone in the West. How was it possible that the cedar nut with the most effective healing properties grow in Siberia? And yet the faculty for producing the oil is located in Turkey. After all, Turkey has no cedars like those found in Siberia. And just what Western powers was the Wausau entrepreneur talking about? Why did he say it would be better just to forget about this issue? Might not those powers be smuggling these products with these extraordinary healing properties out of the Russian Siberian taiga? taiga? Why with such a treasure here at home with such effective properties, a treasure known for centuries, for millennia, even do we spend millions and maybe billions of dollars buying up foreign medicines and swallow them, them up like half-crazed people? How is it that we have lost the knowledge known to our forebearers, our recent forebearers yet, one who lived in our century? And what about the Bible description of that extraordinary happening of over 2,000 years ago? What kind of unknown powers are trying to earnestly to erase our forebearers' knowledge from our own memories? Oh, you better stick to minding your own business. We're told, yes, they are trying to wipe it out and indeed they are succeeding. I was seized by a fit of anger. I checked and yes, cedar oil is sold in our pharmacies but it is sold in foreign packaging. I bought a single 30 gram vial, vial and tried it. The actual oil content, I think, was no more than a couple of drops. The rest was some kind of diluting agent. Compared to what produced in the Consumer Cooperative Institute, well, there was simply no comparison. And these diluted couple of drops cost 50,000 rubles. So what if we didn't buy it abroad, but sold it ourselves? Just the sell of this oil would be enough to raise the whole of Siberia above the poverty level. But how did we ever manage to let go of the technology of our forebears? And here we are, sniveling that we live like paupers. Well, okay, I think I'll come up with something all the same. I'll produce the oil myself and my firm will only get wealthier. I decided I would try a second expedition along the Ob, back up north, using only my headquarters ship, the Patrice Le Mumbai. I loaded a variety of goods for sale into the hold and turned the film viewing room into a store. I decided to hire a new crew and not invite anyone from my firm. As things stood, my firm's financial situation had worsened while I was distracted with my new interests. Two weeks after leaving Norverbix, my security guards reported that they had overheard conversation about the ringing cedar. And in their opinion, the newly hired workers included some pretty strange people, to put it mildly. I began summoning individual crew members to my quarters to talk about the forthcoming trek into the Tega. Some of them even agreed to go on a volunteer basis. Others asked for extra pay for this operation, said it was not something they had agreed for when signing up for work. It was one thing to stay in the comfortable condition aboard ship, quite another to trek 25 kilometers into the Tega and back, carrying loads of wood. My finances at the time were already pretty tight. I had not planned on selling the cedar. After all, 
the oldsters had said it should be given away. Besides, my main interest was not the cedar tree itself, but the secret of how to extract the oil. And of course, it would be fascinating to find out all the details connected with it. Little by little, with the help of my security guards, I realized that there would be attempts made to spy on my movements, especially during any time I spent ashore. But for that, for what purpose was unclear? And who was behind the would-be spies? I thought and thought about it and decided that to be absolutely certain, I would somehow have to outsmart everyone at once. Anastasia by Vladimir, Vladimir McGrath The Ringing Cedar Book One Chapter Two Encounter Without a word to anyone, I arranged to have the ship stop not far from the place where I had met the old man the previous year. Then I took a small motorboat and reached the village. I gave orders to the captain to continue along the trade route. I hope I would be able, with the help of the local residents, to look up the two old fellows, see the ringing cedar with my own eyes and determine the cheapest way of getting it back to the ship. Tying the motorboat to a rock on the shore, I was about to head for one of the little houses close by, but spotting a woman standing along on the river bank, I decided to approach her. The woman had on an old quilted jacket, long skirt, and high rubber luches of the kind worn by many residents of the northern backwards. Two old men I had met there, met here the previous year. It was my grandfather and great grandfather who talked with you here last year, Vladimir, the woman replied. I was amazed. Her voice sounded very young. Her, dicta her diction was crystal clear. She called me by my first name and right off used the informal form of address. I couldn't remember the names of the oldsters or whether we had introduced ourselves at all. I thought now we must have done so since this woman knew my name. I asked her, <coughs> deciding to continue in the same informal tone. And how do you call yourself? Anastasia, the woman answered, stretching out her hand toward me, pound down as though expecting me to kiss it. This gesture of a countrywoman in a quilted jacket and galoosh just standing on a deserted shore and trying to act like a lady of the world amused me no end. <clears throat> I shook her hand. Naturally, I was going to kiss it. Anastasia gave me an embarrassed smile and suggested I go with her into the taiga to where her family lived. The only thing is we shall have to make our way through the taiga, 25 kilometers. That is not too much for you. <clears throat> well, of course, it's rather far, but can you show me the ringing cedar? Yes, I can. You know all about that, you'll tell. You'll tell me. I should tell you what I know. Then let's go. Along the way, Anastasia told me how their family, their kin, had been living in the cedar forest generation after seven, generation after generation. As her forebears had said, over the course of several millennia, it is only extremely rarely that they find themselves in direct contact with people from our civilized society. These contacts do not occur in their places of permanent residence, but only when they come into the villages under the guise of hunters or travelers from some other 
settlement. Anastasia herself had been to two big cities, Tomsk and Moscow, but only for one day each. Not even to say the night, not even to stay the night. She wanted to see whether she might have been mistaken in her perceptions about the lifestyle of city people. She had saved the money for the trip by selling berries and dried mushrooms. A local village woman had lent her her passport. Anastasia did not approve of her grandfather and great-grandfather's idea of giving away the ring and cedar with, it, with its healing properties to a whole lot of people. When asked why, she replied that the pieces of cedar would be scattered among evildoers, evildoers as well as good people. In all probability, probability, the majority of the pieces would be snatched up by negative thinking individuals. In the final analyst, and the final analyst, they might end up doing more harm than good. The most important thing, in her opinion, was to promote the good and to help people through whom the good was accomplished. If everyone were ben benefited at random, the imbalance between good and evil would not be changed, but would stay the same or even get worse. After my encounter with the Siberian Osters, I looked through a variety of popular science literature, along with a host of hysterical and scholarly works describing the unusual properties of the cedar. Now I was trying to penetrate and comprehend what Anastasia was saying about the lifestyle of the cedar people and thinking to myself, now what if anything can that be compared to? I thought about the Lakovs, a true story many Russians are familiar with from the account by Vesli Peskov of another family that lived in an isolated life for many years in the taiga. They were written up in the paper, Komsomlakaya Pravalda, under the headline, Dead End and the Taiga, and were the subject of television programs. I had formulated for myself an impression of the Lakovs as people who knew nature pretty well, but had a rather fuzzy concept of our modern civilized life. But this was a different situation. Anastasia gave the impression of someone who was perfectly acquainted with her life and with something else besides that I couldn't fathom at all. She was quite as ease discussing our city life. She seemed to know it firsthand. We walk along getting deeper into the woods and after about five kilometers stopped to rest. At this point, she took off her jacket, kerchief, and long skirt and placed them in the hollow of a tree. All she was wearing now was a short, lightweight frock. I was dumbstruck at what I saw. If I were a believer in miracles, I would put this down to something like extreme metamorphosis. For now, here before me stood a very young woman with long golden hair and a fantastic figure. Her beauty was most unusual. It would be hard to imagine how any of the winners of the world's most prestigious beauty contests could revive her appearance. Or, as it later turned out, her intellectual prowess. Everything about this tiger woman was alluring, simply spellbinding. You are probably tired, asked Anastasia. Would you like to rest for a while? We sat down on the grass and I was able to get a closer look at her face. There was no cosmetic covering, her perfect features, her lovely well-toned skin bore no resemblance to the weather beaten faces of people. I knew who lived in the Siberian backwoods. Her large grayish blue eyes had a kindly look and her lips betrayed a gentle smile. As indicated, she wore a short, lightweight smock, something like a nightshirt, at the same time giving the impression that her body was not at all cold 
in spite of the 12 to 15 degree temperatures. I decided to have a bite to eat. I reached into my bag and took out sandwiches along with a travel bottle filled with good cognac. I offered to share it with Anastasia, but she refused the cognac and for some reason even declined to eat with me. While I was snacking, Anastasia lay on the grass, her eyes blissfully closed as though inviting the sun's rays to caress her. The rays reflected off her upturned palms with a golden glow. Lying there half exposed, she appeared absolutely gorgeous. I looked at her and thought to myself, now why do women always bear to the limit either their legs or their breasts or everything at once with their mini skirts and decolletage? <clears throat> it is not to appeal to the men around them as if, say, if, as, as if to say, look how charming I am, how open and accessible. And what are men obliged to do then? Fight against their fleshly passions, passions and thereby denigrate women with their lack of attention? Or make advances toward them and thereby break a God-given law? When I had finished eating, I asked, Anastasia, you're not afraid of walking through the taiga alone? There is nothing I have to fear, replied Anastasia. Interesting, but how would you defend yourself if you happen to encounter two or three burly men? Geologists or hunters, let's say. She didn't answer, only smiled. I thought, how is that this so extraordinary, alluring young beauty could not be afraid of anyone or anything? What happened next will make me feel uncomfortable, even to this day. I grabbed her by her shoulders and pulled her close to me. She didn't offer any strong resistance, although I could feel cons a considerably degree of strength in her resilient body. Resilient body. The last thing I remember before losing consciousness was her saying, do not do this, calm down. And even before that, I remember being suddenly overcome by a powerful attack of fear, a fear of what I couldn't grasp. As sometimes happens in childhood when you find yourself at home all alone and suddenly become afraid of something. When I woke up, she was on her knees, bending over me. One hand lay upon my chest while the other was waving to someone up above or to either side. She was smiling, though not at me, but rather it seemed at someone who was invisibly surrounding us or above us. Anastasia seemed to be literally gesturing to her invisible friend that there was nothing amiss going on. Then she calmly and tenderly looked me in the eye. Calm down, Vladimir, it is over now. But what was it, I asked. Harmony's disapproval of your attitude toward me, of the desire aroused in you. You will be able to understand it all later. What's Harmony got to do with it? It's you. It's only that you yourself began to resist. And I too did not accept it. It was offensive to me. I sat up and pulled my bag over toward me. Come on now. She didn't accept me. It was offensive to her. Oh, you woman, you just do everything you can to tempt us. You bare your legs, stick out your breasts, walk around in high heel shoes. That's very uncomfortable, and yet you do it. You walk in rigor with all your charm. But as soon as, oh, I don't need that. I'm not the, that way. What do you wriggle for then, hypocrites? I'm an entrepreneur, and I've seen a lot of your sorts. You all want the same thing, only you all act it out differently. So why did Anastasia take off your outer clothes? The weather's not that hot. And then you lolled about on the grass here with that alluring smile of yours. I am not that comfortable with clothing, Vladimir. I put it on when I leave the woods and go out among people. 
but only so I can look like everyone else. I just lay down to relax in the sun and not disturb you while you were eating. So you didn't want to disturb me. Well, you did. Please forgive me, Vladimir. Of course, you are right about every woman wanting to attract a man's attention, but not just to her legs and breasts. What, what she wants is not to let pass by the one man who can see more than just those things. But nobody's been passing by here. And what is this more than must be seen when it's your legs that are front and center? Oh, you woman, you're so illogical. Yes, unfortunately, that is the way life sometimes turns out. Maybe we should get along, Vladimir. Have you finished eating? Are you rested? The thought crossed my mind. Is it worth going on with this philosophizing wild woman? But I replied, fine, let's go. Book one, chapter three, Beast or Man. We continue our journey to Anastasia, Anastasia's home. Her other clothes left behind in the tree holler. Her galoshes too, she was still wearing the short lightweight frock. She herself picked up my bag and offered to carry it. Barefoot, she walked ahead of me with an amazing light and graceful step, waving the bag about her with ease. We talked the whole time. Talking with her on mice on any subject was most interesting, perhaps because she had her own strange ideas about everything. Sometimes Anastasia would whirl about while we were walking. She turned her face to me, laughing, and kept on walking backward for a while, quite absorbed in the conversation without so much as a glance down at her feet. How could she walk like that and not once stumble or prick her bare foot against the knot of a dry branch? We didn't seem to be following any visible path on the other hand. Our way was not hindered by the tangle undergrowth so common in the taiga. As she walked, she would occasionally touch or quickly brush by a leaf or a twig on a bush, or bending or without bulking. She would tear off some little blade of grass and eat it, just like little, a little creature, I thought. When berries were handy, Anastasia would offer me a few to eat as we walk. The muscles of her body didn't seem to have any unusual features. Her overall physique appeared quite average, not too thin and not too plump. A resilient, well-fed and very beautiful body. But from what I could tell, it possessed a goodly degree of strength and extremely sharp reflexes. Once when I stumbled and started to fall, my arms outstretched in front of me. Anastasia whirled around with lighting speed, quickly placing her free hand under me, and I landed with my chest on her palm. Her fingers spread wide. There was there she was supporting my body with the palm of one hand, helping it regain its normal position. During all this time, she went on talking with not the slightest sign of strain. After I had straightened up with the help of her hand, we continue on, her, on our way, as though nothing would ever had happened. For some reason, my mind momentarily rested on the gas pistol I had in my bag. With all the interesting conversation, I hadn't realized how much ground we had actually been covering. All at once, Anastasia stopped, put my bag down under a tree, and joyfully exclaimed, Here we are at home. I looked around. A neat little glade, dotted with flowers, 
amidst a host of majestic cedars, but, a, but not a single structure to be seen, not even a hut, and a word nothing. Not even a primitive lean-to. But Anastasia was beside herself with joy, as though we had arrived at a most comfortable dwelling. And where is your house? Where do you eat, sleep, take shelter from the rain? This is my house, Vladimir. I have everything here. Her dark sense of this quiet began to come over me. Where is everything? Let's have a tea kettle so we can at least heat up some water on the fire. Let's have an axe. I do not have a kettle or an axe, Vladimir, and it would be best not to light a fire. What are you talking about? She doesn't even have a kettle. The water in my bottle is all gone. You saw when I ate. I even threw the bottle away. Now there's only a couple of swallows of cognac left. To get to the river or the village is a good day's walk. And I'm so tired and thirsty. Where do you get water from? What do you drink out of? Seeing my agitation, Anastasia herself showed signs of concern. She quickly took me by the hand and led me through the glade into the forest, admonishing me along the way. Not to worry, Vladimir, please do not get upset. I shall take care of everything. You just rest. Get a good sleep. I shall take care of everything. You will not be cold. You are thirsty. I shall give you something to drink right away. Less than 10 or 15 meters from the glade, beyond a clump of bushes, we came across a small taiga lake. Anastasia quickly scooped up a small quantity of water in her cupped hands and raised it to my face. Here is some water. Drink it, please. What are you, crazy? How can you drink wall water out of some puddle in the woods? You saw how I was drinking. Pozami? On board ship, even for washing, we pass the river water through a special filter. Chlorinated, ozonize it. It's not a puddle, Vladimir. This is pure living water. Good water. Not half destroyed water like yours. You can drink this water just like mother's milk. Look. Anastasia raised her cup hands to her lips and took a drink. I blurted out, Anastasia, are you some kind of beast? Why a beast? Because my bed is not like yours? There are no cars, no appliance, because you live, live like a beast in the forest. You haven't any possession and you seem to enjoy that. Yes, I enjoy living here. There you see, you just made my point. Do you consider, Vladimir, that what distinguishes man from all other creatures living on earth is his possession of manufactured objects, yes, but even more precisely, his civilized living conditions. And do you consider your living condition to be more civilized? Yes, of course you do. But I am not a beast, flatter me. I am a man. Book 1, Chapter 4 Who Are They? Subsequently, after spending three days with Anastasia and observing how this strange young woman lives all by herself in the remote Siberian taiga, I began to understand a little something of her lifestyle and to be confronted by a number of questions regarding our own. One of them still haunts me to this day is our system of education and bringing up children sufficient to comprehend the meaning of existence, to arrange every individual's life priorities in the correct order. Does it help or hinder our ability to make sense of man's essence and purpose? We have set up a vast educational system it is on the basis of this system 
that we teach our children and each other in kindergarten school, university and post-grad programs. It is this system that enables us to invent things to fly into space. We structure our lives in accordance with it. Through its help, we strive to construct some happiness for ourselves. We strive to fathom the universe and the atom, along with all sorts of anomalous phenomena. We'd love to discuss and to describe them at great length and sensational stories in both the popular press and scholarly publications. But there is one phenomenon which for some reason we try with all our might to avoid. Desperately try to avoid. One gets the impression that we are afraid to talk about it. We are afraid, I say, because it could so easily knock the when out of our commonly accepted systems of education and scientific deductions and make a mockery of the objects inherent in our lifestyle. And we try to pretend that such a phenomena does not exist, but it does. And it will continue to exist. However much we try to turn away from it or avoid it, isn't it time to take a closer look at this and just maybe through the collective effort of all our human minds together, find an answer to the following questions. If you take all our great thinkers, without exception, people who have formulated religious teachings, all sorts of teachings, which the vast majority of humanity are following, or at least endeavoring to follow, why is it that before formulating their teachings, they became recall recluses, went into solitude, in most cases, to the forest? Not to some super academy, mind you, but to the forest. Why did the Old Testament Moses go off into a mountaintop forest before returning and presenting to the world the wisdom set forth on his tablets of stone? Why did Christ Jesus go off, away from his disciples, into the desert, mountains, and forests? Why did a man named Siddhartha Gautam, Gautama, who lived in India in the 6th century AD, spend seven years alone in the forest? After which the three close came out of the forest, back to people, complete with a set of teachings. Teachings which even to this day, many centuries later, arouse a multitude of human minds. And people built huge temples and call these teachings Buddhism. And the man himself eventually came to be known as Buddha. And what about our own not-so-ancient forebears? Now acknowledge as historical figures. Men such as Seraphim, Sorvitsky, or Sorvigrognitsky, why did they too go off to become recluses in the forest? And how were they able, after a short period of time there, to so fathom the depths of wisdom that the kings of this world made the long journey through uncharted wilderness to seek their advice. Monasteries and majestic temples were raised at, at the locations of their respective solitudes. Thus, for example, the Trinity Sergiev Monastery and the town of Sergiev Posad near Moscow today attracts thousands of visitors each year, and it all started from a single forest recluse. Why? Who or what enabled these people to obtain their wisdom? Who gave them knowledge? 
who brought them closer to understanding the essence of life. How did they live? What did they do? What did they think about doing their forest solitude? These questions confronted me sometime after my conversation, conversations with Anastasia. After I had started reading everything that I could lay my hands on regarding recluses. But even today, I haven't found answers. Why has nothing been written about their solitude experiences? The answers, I think, must be sought through a collective effort. I should try to describe the events of my three-day stay in the Siberian Taiga forest and my impressions from my conversation with Anastasia in the hopes that someone will be able to fathom the essence of this phenomenon and put together a clearer picture of our way of life. For now on the basis of all that I have seen and heard, only one thing is crystal clear to me. People who live in solitude in the forest, including Anastasia, see what is going in up what is going on in our lives from a point of view completely different from ours. Some of Anastasia's ideas are the exact opposite of what is commonly accepted. Who is closer to the truth? Who can judge? My task is simply to record what I have seen and heard and thereby give others an opportunity to come up with answers. Anastasia lives in the forest altogether alone. She has no house to call her own. She hardly wears any clothes and does not store any provisions. She is the descendant of people who have been living here for thousands of years and represents what is literally a whole different civilization. She and those like her have survived to the present day through what I can only term the wisest possible decisions. Very likely the only correct decisions. When they are among us, they blend in with us, trying to appear no different from ordinary people. But in their places of habitual residence, they merge with nature. It is not easy to find their habitual dwelling places. Indeed, man's presence in such places is betrayed only by the fact that they are more beautiful and better taken care of, like Anastasia's forest glade, for example. Anastasia was born here and is an integral part of the natural surroundings. In contrast to our celebrated recluses, she did not go off into the forest simply for a time, as they did. She was born in the taiga, taiga and visits our world only for brief periods. And on the face of it, there seems to be quite a simple explanation for the strong fear that overwhelmed me and made me lose consciousness. When I attempted to possess Anastasia, just as we tame a cat or dog, an elephant, a tiger, tiger, an eagle, and so on. Here, everything around has been tamed. And this everything is incapable of permitting anything bad to happen to her. Anastasia told me that when she was born, and while she was still under a year old, her mother could leave her alone on the grass. And you didn't die from hunger, I asked. The Tager recluse first looked at me in surprise, but then explained. There should be no problems of finding food for men. One should eat just as one breathes, not paying attention to the food, not distraction one thought, not distracting one thought from more important things. The Creator has left that task up to others so that men can live as men fulfilling his own destiny. She snapped her fingers and right away 
a little squirrel popped up beside her, hopping into her hand. Anastasia lifted the creature's muzzle up to her mouth, and the squirrel passed them from its mouth into hers, a seed or not seed. Its shell already removed. This did not seem to be anything out of the ordinary. I remember how back at the academic complex near Novaburst, a lot of squirrels were quite used to people and would beg for food from passersby and even get angry if they weren't giving anything. Here I was simply observing the process in reverse. But this here was the taiga, and I said, in the normal world, our world, everything's arranged differently. If you, Anastasia, try snapping your fingers at a, at a privately run kiosk or even beat on a drum, nobody would give you anything. And here you say the Creator has decided everything. Who is to blame if man has decided to change the Creator's creative design? Whether it is for the better or for the worse, that is up to you that is up to you to divine. This is the kind of dialogue I had with Anastasia on the question of human sustenance. Her position is simple. It is sinful to waste thought on things like food, and she does not think about it. But for us in our civilized world, as it happens, we are obliged to give it thought. We know from books, reports in the press, and TV programs of a multitude of examples of infants who have found themselves out in the wilds and ended up being fed by wolves. Here in the Tega, generation of people have made their permanent residence and their relationship to the animal kingdom is different from ours. I asked Anastasia, why aren't you cold when here I am in a warm jacket? Because she replied, the bodies of people who wrap themselves in clothing to hide from the cold and heat gradually lose their ability to adapt to change in their environment. In my case, this, capaci this capacity of the human body has not been lost, and so I have no need of any special clothing. Book 1, Chapter 5, A Forest Bedroom. I wasn't at all equipped to spend a night in the wilds of the forest. Anastasia put me to bed in some kind of cave, hollowed out of the ground. Exhausted after my wearing trek, I quickly fell fast asleep. When I woke up, I felt a sense of bliss and comfort, as though I were lying in a magnificently comfortable bed. The cave or dugout was spacious, appointed with small feathery cedar twigs and dry grass, which filled the surrounding space with a fragrant aroma. As I stretched and spread my limbs, one hand touched a furry pelt, and I determined at once that Anastasia must be something of a hunter. I moved closer to the pelt, pressing my back to its warmth, and decided to have another little snooze. Anastasia was standing in the entranceway to my forest bedroom. Noticing I was awake, she said at once, May this day come to you with blessings, Vladimir. And you should, in turn, greet it with your blessing. Only please do not be frightened. Then she clapped her hands, and the pelt, I was horrid struck at the realization that this was no pelt. Out of the cave, a huge bear began to gingerly crawl, receiving a pat of approval from Anastasia, 
the bear licked her hand and began lumbering off into the forest. It turned out that she had placed some belladonna herbs under my head for a pillow and made the bear lie down beside me so I wouldn't get cold. She herself had curled up outdoors in front of the entranceway. Now how could you do such a thing to me, Anastasia? He could have torn me to stretch or crushed me to death. First of all, it is not a he, but a she bear. She could not possess, she could not possibly have done anything to harm you. Anastasia responded. She is very obedient. She really enjoys it when I give her tasks to carry out. She never even budged the whole night. Just nuzzled her nose up to my leg and just kept blissfully still. She was so happy. Only she did give a little shooter when you wave your arms about in your sleep and slap her backside. Book One, Chapter Six, Anastasia's Morning. Anastasia goes to bed at nightfall in one of the shelters, hollowed out by the creatures of the forest, most often in the bear's dugout. When it is warm, she can sleep right on the glass. The first thing she does upon awaking is often an exuberant outburst of joy to the rising sun, to the new sprouts on all the twigs, to the new shoots of growth popping up from the earth. She touches them with her hands, strokes them, occasionally adjusts something into place. Then she runs over to the little trees and gives them a thump on their trunks. The treetops shake and shower down on her, something resembling pollen or dew. Then she lies down on the grass and blissfully stretches and squirms. Her whole body becomes covered with what appears to be a moist cream. Then she runs off and jumps into her little lake, splashes about and dives to the bottom. She's a terrific diver. Her relationship with the animal world around her is very much like people's relationship with their household pets. Many of them watch Anastasia as she does her morning routine. They don't approach her, but all she has to do is look in the direction of one of them and make the tiniest beckoning gesture. And the lucky one jumps up on the spot and rushes to her feet. I saw how one morning she clowned around playing with a she-wolf just as one might play with the family dog. Anastasia clapped the wolf on the shoulder and dashed off at full tit. The wolf gave chase and just as she was about to catch up with her, Anastasia still on the run, suddenly jump in the air, repel herself with both feet off the trunk of a tree and dash off in another direction. The wolf couldn't stop but kept on running past the tree, finally making an about turn and chasing after the laughing Anastasia. Anastasia gives absolutely no thought to feeling or clothing herself. She most often walks about nude or semi-nude. She sustains herself with cedar nuts along with varieties of herbs, berries, and mushroom. She eats only dry mushrooms. She never goes hunting for nuts or mushrooms herself, never stores up any kind of provision, even for the winter. Everything is prepared for her by her, for her by the multitude of squirrels dwelling in these parts. Squirrels storing up nuts for the winter is nothing out of the ordinary. That's what they do everywhere, following their natural instincts. 
I was struck by something else. Though, at the snap of Anastasia's fingers, any squirrels nearby would compete to be the first to jump into her outstretch hand and give her the kernel of an already shelled cedar nut. And whenever Anastasia slaps her leg, bent at the knee, the squirrels make some sort of sound, as if signaling the others, and they all start bringing dried mushrooms. And this they do, it seemed to me, with a good deal of pleasure. I thought she had trained them herself, but Anastasia told me that their actions were instinctive. And the mother squirrel herself teaches this to her little ones by example. Perhaps one of my early forebears once trained, trained them, but most likely this is simply what they are destined to do. By the time winter has set in, each squirrel has stored up several times as many supplies as it can, as it can use for itself. To myself, to my question, How do you keep from freezing during the winter without the propel proper clothing? Anastasia replied with a question of her own. In your own words, are there no examples of people able to withstand the cold without special clothing? And I remembered the book by Porfir Ivanov who went around barefoot and wearing only shorts no matter how cold the weather. It tells in the book how the facets wanting to test the endurance abilities of this extraordinary Russian poured cold water, water over him in a minus 20 degree frost and then made him ride naked on a motorcycle. In her early childhood, in addition to her mother's milk, Anastasia was able to draw upon the milk of many different animals. They freely allowed her access to their nipples. She makes absolutely no ritual of meal time, never sits down just to eat, but picks berries and sprouts of plants as she walks and continues on with her activities. By the end of my three day stay with her, I could no longer relate to her as I had done at our first encounter. After all I had seen and heard, Anastasia had been transformed for me in some kind of being, but not a beast, since she had such a high degree of intelligence and, there, and then there's her memory. Her memory is such that she, of course, forgets nothing of what she has seen or heard at any moment in time. At times, it seems that her abilities are well beyond the comprehension of the average people. But this very attitude toward her is something that greatly distresses and upsets her. In contrast to certain people, we all know with unusual abilities people who wrap themselves in an aura of mystery and exclusivity. She constantly tried to explain and reveal the mechanism underlying her abilities to prove that there was nothing supernatural to man in them or in her, that she was man, a woman. And she repeatedly asked me to bear that in mind. I did attempt to keep it in mind after that and try to find an explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon. In our civilization, one brain works to develop a life for oneself, obtain food to eat and satisfy one's sexual instincts. In Anastasia will, no time is spent on these things whatsoever. Even people who find themselves in a situation like the Lux Coves are obliged to constantly give thought to how to feed and shelter themselves. They don't get help from nature to the same extent as does Anastasia. There are all sorts of tribes living far from civilization that are not blessed with this kind of contact. According to Anastasia, 
it is because their thoughts are not pure enough. Nature and the animal world feel this. Book 1, Chapter 7 Anastasia's Ray I think the most unusual mystical phenomena I witnessed during my time in the forest was Anastasia's ability to see not only individuals at great distance, distance but also what was going on in their lives. Possibly other recluses have had a similar ability. She did this with the help of an, of an invisible ray. She maintained this with something everybody has. But people don't know about it and are unable to make use of it. Man has still not invented anything that is not already in nature. The technology behind television is but a poor imitation of the possibilities of this ray. The ray being invisible, I didn't believe it, and it, in spite of her repeated attempts to demonstrate and explain how it worked, to find some proof or plausible explanation, and then one day, tell me, Vladimir, what do you think daydreams are? And do many people dream of the future? Daydreaming, I think a lot of people are able to do that. It's when you imagine yourself in a future of your own desire. Fine. So you do not deny that man has the capacity to visualize his own future. To visualize very specific situations. That I don't deny. And what about intuition? Intuition is probably the feeling one has when instead of analyzing what or why something might happen, some sort of feeling suggests the right thing to do. So you do not deny that in man there exists something besides ordinary anal anal analytical reasoning that helps him determine his own and others' behavior. Well, let's say that's true. Wonderful, good, exclaimed Anastasia. Now the night dream, the night dream, what is that? The dreams almost all people have when they are asleep. The night dream, that's, I really don't know what, what that is. When you're asleep, a dream is simply a dream. All right, all right. Let us call it just a dream. But you do not deny it exists. You and other people are aware that someone in a dream state, when his body is almost beyond the control of a part of his consciousness, can see people and all sorts of things going on. Well, that, I think, is something nobody will deny. But still, in a dream, people can communicate, hold conversations, empathize. Yes, they can. And what do you think? Can a person control his dream? Call up in the dream images and events he would like to see? Just like on ordinary television, for example. I don't think that would work for anyone. The dream somehow comes all by itself. You are man wrong. Man can control everything. Man is designed to control everything. The ray I am telling you about consists of information one possesses. Concepts, intuition, emotional feelings, and as a result of dreamlike visions consciously controlled by man's will. How can a dream be controlled in a dream? Not in a dream, wide awake, as if pre-programmed and with absolute accuracy. You only experience this in a dream, 
and it is chaotic. Man has lost most of his ability to control, to control natural phenomena in himself. So he has decided that a night dream is simply an incidental byproduct of his tired brain. In fact, almost everybody on the earth, well, maybe I should try helping you see something at a distance right here and now. Go ahead. Lie down on the grass and relax. Let go so that your body draws less energy. It is important that you are comfortable. Nothing in the way. Now think about the person you know best. Your wife, for example. Recollect her habits, how she walks, her clothing, where you think she might be right now, and turn the whole thing over to your imagination. I remembered my wife knowing that at that moment she might be at our country home. I imagined the house. and some of the furnishings and things. I remembered a great deal and in some detail, but I didn't see anything. I told Anastasia about all this and she replied, you are not able to let go all the ways as though you were going to go to sleep. I shall help you close your eyes, stretch out your arms in different directions. Closing my eyes, I felt her fingers touch mine. I began to immerse myself in a dream or a wakeful doze. There was my wife standing in the kitchen of our country home. Over her usual dressing gown, she was wearing a knitted cardigan. That meant it was cold in the house. Again, some kind of trouble with the heating system. My wife was making coffee on the gas stove and something else in the small crock pot. My wife's face was gloomy and unhappy. Her movements were sluggish. All at once, she turned her head, tripped over to the window, looked out at the rain and smiled. The coffee in the stove was spilling over. She picked up the pot with its overflowing liquid, but didn't frown or get upset as she usually did. She took off the cardigan. I woke up. Well, did you see anything? asked Anastasia. I did indeed, but maybe it was just an ordinary dream. How could it be ordinary? Did you not plan on seeing your wife in particular? Yes, I did, and I saw her. But where is the proof that she was actually there in the kitchen at the moment I saw her in the dream? Remember this day and hour, Vladimir. If you want to have proof, when you get home, ask her. Was there not something else out of the ordinary that you noticed? Can't think of anything. You mean to say you did not notice a smile on your wife's face when she went over to the window? She was smiling and she did not get upset when the coffee spilled. That I did notice. She probably saw something interesting out the window which made her feel good. All she saw out the window was rain. Rain which she never likes. So why was she smiling? I too was watching your wife through my ray, ray and warmed her up. So your ray warmed up, warmed her up. What about mine? Too cold. You were only looking out of curiosity. You did not put any feeling into it. So your ray can warm people up at, di at a distance? Yes, it can do that. And what else can it do? obtain certain kinds of information or transmit. It can cheer up a person's mood and partially take away someone's illness. 
there are a lot of other things it can do depending on the energy available and the degree of feelings will and desire and can you see the future of course the past too the future and the past they are pretty much the same thing it is only the external details that are different the essence always remains unchanged how can that be? What can remain unchanged? Well, for example, a thousand years ago, people wore different clothes. They had different instruments at their disposal. But that is not the essence. Back a thousand years ago, just like today, people had the same feelings. Feelings are not subject to time. Fear, joy, love, just think. Yaroslav the wise, Ivan the terrible, and the Egyptian pharaohs were all capable of loving a woman with exactly the same feeling as you or any other man today. Interesting. Only I'm not sure what it means. You say every person can have a ray like this. Of course everyone can. Even today people still have feelings and intuitions. The capacity to dream of the future to conjecture, to visualize specific situation, to have dreams while they sleep. Only it is all chaotic and uncontrollable. Maybe some kind of training necessary. Some exercises could be developed. Some exercises might help. But you know, Vladimir, there is one absolute condition before the ray can be controlled by the will. And what condition is that? It is absolutely necessary to keep one's thought pure as the strength of the ray depends on the strength of the radiant feelings. Now there you go. Just when everything was starting to get clear, what have pure thoughts go to do with it? What have pure thoughts got to do with it? radiant feelings they are what power the ray that's enough anastasia i'm already losing interest next you'll be adding something else i have already told you what is essential you can say what you like but you got too many darn conditions let's talk about something else something a little a little simpler all day long, Anastasia engages in meditation, visualization, all sorts of situations from our past, present, and future life. Anastasia possesses, possesses a phenomenal memory. She can remember a multitude of people she has seen in her imagination, all through her ray, and what they have been going through mentally. She's a consummate actress. She can imitate the way they walk and talk and even think the way they do. She concentrates her thought on the life experiences of mil millions of people in the past and presence. present. She uses the knowledge she gains from this to visualize the future and to help others. This she does at a great distance by means of her invisible ray. And the ones she helps through suggestion or decision or the ones she heals having the slightest idea that she is helping them. It was only later that I found out that similar rays, invisible to the eye, only of different degrees of strength, emanate from every individual. The academician Anarov Akimov photographed them with special devices and published his results in 1996 in the May issue of the magazine Chudusai Pobuta Wonders and Adventures. Unfortunately, we are unable to use these rays as she does. In scientific literature, a phenomenon such as this ray is known as torsion, torsion field. 
Anastasia's worldview is unusual and interesting. What is God, Anastasia? Does he exist? If so, why hasn't anyone seen him? God is the interplanetary mind or intelligence. He is not to be found in a single mass. Half of him in the non-material realm of the universe. This is the sum, total of all energies. The other half of him is dispersed across the earth, in every individual and every man. The dark forces strive to block these particles. What do you think awaits our civilization? In the long term, a realization of the futility of the technocratic path of development and a movement back to our primal origins. You mean to say that all our scholars are immature beings who were leading us into a dead end? I mean to say they are accelerating the process. They are bringing you closer to the realization that you are on the wrong path. And so all the cars and houses we built are pointless, yes. You're not bored living here alone, Anastasia? Alone without television or telephone? These primitive things you mention, man has possessed them right from the very beginning. Only in a more perfect, perfect form I have them. Both television and telephone. Well, what is television? A device through which certain information is served up to an almost atrophied human imagination and scenes and in story plots or act out. I can, through my own imagination, outline the plot of any story and act out the most improbable situation, even take part in them myself, just like having an influence on the outcome. Oh dear, I suppose I have not been making myself too clear, huh? In the telephone, every man can talk with any other individual without the aid of a telephone. All that is needed is the will and desire of both parties in a developed imagination.